Kim, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Guy. It's such a privilege to be here. Imagine we're at an intimate dinner, dinner table full of strangers, and you sit next to someone and they ask you, what do you do? What would you say? It's an interesting question, isn't it? It's very... I, I feel like I could say, you know, I'm an aromatherapist, I have a skincare company, I do podcasting, I speak, but that's not what I say. I say I help people fall in love with themselves. Beautiful. Where does your passion for self-love and falling in love come from? Because I've noticed the more I've looked into your work and what you speak about, it's, it's just oozing out of you. Like you, you, you live it, you breathe it, and you, you are it as far as I'm concerned. So I'm always intrigued how and why that is the case. I think I've always been really passionate at learning about human beings, how we tick. Even from a little girl, I was always curious as to why my mum behaved that way or why my dad that when they split, I was happy when they split. Um, I guess if you want me to go quite personal, you know, I went through abuse and sexual abuse and, and court cases. And, oh, wow. and I was really curious, even at the age of nine, when all that was happening, as to why that happened and why did he do those things? And then I was really interested when my grandmother died at age nine as well. What, why did she die so young at 49? And I think I've just had that real curious mindset around. And when I found out she was really unhappy, I just thought, wow, what makes us tick? Like, what is this? And all through my life, I've loved people always, no matter how hurt I've been or how um, distraught I've been by what people have said or maybe a fallout or argument or whatever it is. I've always thought there's a way to heal and there's always a way where we can get back to what really matters and that is believe in our true selves. And it's fascinating because at school, you know, if you said to someone that they loved themselves, they were kind of up themselves. It was like a negative. And yet if I look at it, the one thing I'd want for my children and for anyone that I love is to know that they do love themselves, that they do care for who they are and that they do know that they're worthy. But it's fascinated me, Guy, for so long to really come to appreciate that not one of us escapes life without pain or anguish or hurt or suffering of some sort. And if that's the case, the opposing force of that is love. And in all the books I've read and all the authors I've listened to and all the workshops I've done, there's two opposing forces. One is love and one is fear. Mm. And each day we have a choice in which place we sit. And it's not what happens to us in life, but how we respond or react to it that keeps showing up and giving us an opportunity to test it. And I think that's where my passion for learning about it and knowing wholeheartedly that at the foundation of everything, is the ability to love ourselves. Wow. Now, you mentioned a couple of things I had no idea about that. It's such an early on to have something traumatic happen. How come it helps define you to be self-love, where others you think it can happen that we carry those burdens heavily and never address them? Why, why was it different for you? Do you think for yourself? Well, for a start, I think let's be fair. The the the, the guy that hurt me and um, abused me, um, when my mum found out about it, of course, she was like a tiger. She was a lioness, oh, wow. and um, he was a butcher, and threatened to cut off my hand with a big knife if I told anybody. So I was, you know, I was nine. Oh, so God. I was scared. Um, but when my mum had heard, and it was because someone else had told her that he was doing this. Um, you know, she took it to the courts. And so I guess I came away from that experience knowing that I d it wasn't my fault. It, mm. and, and I had someone protect, even though I wasn't protected, I was protected, if that makes sense. But I've also learned through life that it's about the meaning we put into things. And I've done a lot of personal growth workshops um, from the forum right through to psychology, right through to landmark, you know, like um, NLP. Like I've done so, I, I am so passionate and interested in what makes us tick that I guess it really comes down to the meaning that we put into it. And you know, I've met people who have had 
terrible things happen to them, yet they're full of love. And like you say, and others that have had something awful happen to them, and it's meant that they hate men or they hate life or they attract more. And that in itself is fascinating because it shows you we are attractors. What we put out there, we attract. And the more we attract it, the more maybe the universal lessons, maybe their opportunities. Some would say if you're not on this personal growth journey, they would just say it was bad luck those of us that are more interested and inclined to believe in something bigger and the the meaning of what we are all here for is that there are opportunities. And I'm not saying that in the throes of challenge, I'm sitting there going, wow, I'm really glad this happened. And oh, wow, I'm going to learn from this and can't wait to share this story. Um, that's not the case. When we're in the throes of it, there is no doubt it is agonizing and it's treacherous and all of those things that we wouldn't wish on anyone. But I also know that it's through those struggles, challenges, and those treacherous times that as we crawl through them, as we choose to have help through them, or as we choose to grow through what we go through, then we come to a place of more compassion, more empathy, more love, if you really want to go that way, more ability to forgive, more understanding that humans make mistakes, more understanding that we're all fallible, understanding that we are all um, on this quest um, to live our most fullest life. But it just depends at what level you're at, maybe on a soul level as to how far you really want to take that. So yeah, do you, so what I'm hearing is, is that context can be a good thing. The more context you have in, in some form of suffering, sometimes the more we're going to appreciate the joy when we have it. Well, I was in the, <laughs> some would say that's so not fair, that's so cruel, isn't it? But I was in Dharamashala. I did a seven-day retreat with His Holiness, the 12th Kenting Thai Satupa, who is the wow. um, Tibetan Buddhist education, head of education um, of all Tibetan Buddhist monks. And I, had a, I got the privilege of being chosen to have a one-on-one -on -one with him. And as I sat with him, he asked me what my question was. And I said, yes, I have a very big question for you. Why is it humans have to suffer? Why do we have to go through such dark times? Why do we all have to see tragedy and adversity? And he kind of chuckled. He speaks better English than the Dalai Lama, but he chuckled and he said, good question, my child. And he said, but how on earth could you ever understand light if we did not have dark? How could you ever understand high without low? How can you ever understand your good side without appreciating your shadow side? And I really took that on in realizing that actually part of life, we can't all be high all the time. We mm. can't also all be low all the time. And whenever I have the privilege of speaking, one of my first messages to those that are going through a tough time is this too shall pass. We know that it will pass. You will get through it if you choose to. And then I also turn around, if someone was listening to this today, who's in a good part of their life and they're, they're on top of the world, and I've got a piece of advice for them as well, and that is this too shall pass. Um, nothing is static. Nothing ever stays the same. And I think for me personally, Guy, the tragedies, the adversities, the challenges have really made me come to believe in the power of the moment of now of knowing that right now is all that matters, knowing that right here in this moment is all I've got. I've, I can draw a line in the sand about my past. I can't relive it. I can't make it undo it or recreate it. And I certainly can't base my future living in the past, thinking, worrying about something happening again or concerned if it would happen or won't happen because that's not me now. But if I sit here right here right now and think, I'm being interviewed by one of the podcasting world's most extraordinary humans and someone who I really value and really love and respect. I could sit here right now and feel completely humbled. It could almost bring me to tears when I think about it because I've followed you for a long time. And that's the magic that I feel I've experienced through all of the things that I've been through and probably yet to come through is that the people that you attract into your life are there to teach you or open your heart in ways you never imagined if you're willing to be on that same journey. Yeah, beautiful. So well said. I think about um, on my journey what, to what you were saying then, there's like I've got to a point where I feel peaceful inside, if you like, 
and that allows me to be carry that with me wherever I go. Where so when the highs are high and the lows are lows, like there's almost like um, a, a development of self that that has allowed me to be stronger and, and see things for what they are without having to layer the, the the emotions and the past experiences on top of something that can already be challenging or or using the escapism of something high to 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 give me relief from the pain in certain moments if that makes sense mm, yeah very much very I'm, much i'm curious about as well because you do seem like somebody i might you, i might be wrong here but that loves a challenge like you seem to have a very strong determination about yourself and how much do you think that plays into daily life and keeping your your sore sharp if you like so when things do come along and I was very curious because I only found out recently as well that you were you were doing ultra marathons. Am I correct in saying that? That's right. Now that blows my mind because I had um, a guy, a movie director, on um, about eighteen months ago, Sanjay Raul. I listened to that. Three thousand one hundred become right, and his mm-hmm. mentor was Sri Chimnoy, mm-hmm. if I pronounced his name correctly. And it blew me away. What? I had no idea. I'm like, people do this, like this goes on. So I've, I wondered if you could talk to that a little bit. What led you into it? Is, does that lean into the things that we've already just covered around keeping your own so sharp? Because to me, it just seems like sheer hell. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. I, I'm probably a competitive person. You know, I love sport. I played netball to state level. Um, I love doing well at school. I was house captain, you know, strive to be, I wasn't the best at everything, but I certainly strive to give it my all. And, and I don't know why, but maybe my mum, she had me at 17, you know, mum and dad split when I was nine, went through all of that stuff with my grandmother and the, and the abuse and all of those things. And I became mum's right-hand person, if you like, because she, I've also got a younger brother and sister. And mum would work three jobs. And from the age of 10, I was cooking and cleaning and babysitting and bathing my brother and sister. And I guess it wouldn't be allowed at all these days. But but I just knew nothing else other than to rise to the challenge. This is what we have to do. And I put it down to my mum's amazing faith in me to do that. And then when I finished school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went straight to university and I did six months of of law school. And on the sixth month, I was sitting there going, this so isn't me. What what am I doing here? This is not me. And I'd seen an ad that morning in the paper to work in a travel agency. And I thought that sounds way more entertaining and interesting. So I quit uni and went and worked in travel. And I did travel for four years. And it was during that time I opened up my whole world into what's out there and the different landscapes and people and color and uh, um, tapestries of different cultures and things. And then at 19, I um, had won a trip to Perth and I'd been going out with a guy since I was 15 at high school and we just split up and I'd won a ticket to Perth. I was highly competitive and you had to, you know, put in a certain number of entries and I just wanted to go to Perth. I hadn't been there before. I was living in New Zealand. And my girlfriend and I won a first class t- ticket to Perth. And she said to me, there's this really hot guy over there. I think you'll really like him. He's playing cricket for New Zealand. This will cheer you up. And I went, oh, I'm not in the mood for a relationship. It's just really, no, no, I don't really need that. I'm, I'm 19, not looking for it. Anyway, we went to a cricket match, never been to a cricket match in my life. And Danny walked out and was so hot and so gorgeous and hugged me and said hi and in that moment I decided I loved cricket and um, got to sort of hang out with Danny for a little bit and then fell head over heels in love with this guy in a matter of days ridiculous Um, flew back to New Zealand and then ended up quitting my job selling my car and meeting him in Melbourne um, on the Boxing Day Test Match of 1987 in Melbourne took a one-way ticket because I thought, here's my travel adventure. I'm, I'm going to go for this. So I met up with Danny and the New Zealand cricket team, traveled with them for three weeks, and then he returned to New Zealand. But I knew he was 21 and I was 19. I just knew I was ready for him, but I knew he wasn't ready for me. And I remember sobbing on the phone to my mom. And she just said, oh, sweetheart, you know, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it's yours. If it doesn't, it never was. And I knew I had to let him go. And so, but now I'd spent all my money, so I couldn't go and meet my girlfriend in London on my big OE. So I settled into Melbourne 
And there was a gymnasium that I was working in. I love fitness and health. And right next to it was a natural therapies college. And I've always been fascinated by herbs and plants and and nature and things like this. And this 10-week aromatherapy course just caught my eye. I had $180 in my bank account. The course was $160 and I enrolled. And that 10-week course became three years of diplomas and certificates. And it let everything, every time I learned something, I realized I, I didn't know anything. And um, the more I learned, the more I realized I had no idea. And so my aromatherapy diploma, I also went on and did a homeobotanical therapy course. My fitness leadership became a personal trainer. And it was during my sports massage diploma that I had to get up my community hours. And I had to get up 200 hours in the sporting community. And I thought, what's the quickest way to do this? And I was told to go to an ultra marathon event. So I turned up in Melbourne in Coburg, uh, Colac, and it was a 24 hour race. And I was assigned to a guy called Cliff Young. It was a Sri Chinmoy race. And I was assigned to, a, uh, assigned to a guy called Cliff Young, who won the inaugural Sydney to Melbourne race at 68 years of age. And he was known as Cliffy the Shuffler, the potato farmer. And he kind of intrigued me. And he then said to me in the pit stop tent one day, what do you think of ultras? And I said, Cliffy, it's the most boring thing I've ever been to. You're watching 40 athletes run around a 400 meter track for 24 hours. I can think of way better things to do. And he said, well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and run one? And I thought, I'd much rather run one than watch one. So I went over to the laps, lap scoring tent and the next race coming up was a 12 hour race. And it was about three or four weeks away. And I thought, why not? So I entered this race and... Cliffy came up to me at the big, yes. <laughs> how, many, how many laps is it? It's a 400 meter track. So yeah. you've got 12 hours to run as many laps as you can. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's, and they score every lap. And yeah, I turned up at this race. I'd never run beyond 10 Ks in my life. And it was a Sri Chinmoy race. So this, then I started researching a little bit about Sri Chinmoy. Now we didn't have Google back then. It was, mm. I went to the library and realized he was quite an extraordinary human and, Anyway, Cliffy came up to me at the beginning of that race and said, I've just got one piece of advice for you. It's 90% mental and 10% physical. And I thought at 20, yeah, 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 got it. And took off. And I ran, you know, through the first four hours and did my marathon. And, and then all of a sudden this voice appeared in my head and it was, what are you doing? You've got eight hours to go. It hurts. This is stupid. So I quit. And I went into the pit stop tent and I broke down and said, I can't do it. And Cliffy just came in and tapped his head and pushed his heart and said, I told you, this is a, a mental game, not a physical game. And all the Sri Chinmoy people are out there and they're all cheering and there's quotes everywhere. And one of the other quotes was, the race is not always to the swift, but to those that keep on running. And I've never forgotten that. It's not yeah. about being the fastest. It's about the one that doesn't give up. And maybe it's my competitive nature. I don't know. But Cliffy also said to me, you're better off putting one foot in front of the other than sitting here getting cold. So if nothing else, while you're thinking of quitting the race, get back out on the track and walk it. You don't have to run it, just walk it. And then about half an hour later, that voice wasn't there. And then I was feeling better and I was jogging again. And and then it happened about eight times I quit guy and I just hated it, hated every minute. I got blisters the size all over my feet. I had chafing, but Cliffy just kept saying it's, it's the mind game. It's a mind game. Anyway, about two hours to go, one of the lap scorers came up to me and she said, do you realize you could win this? You're actually, you know, you're not far from the front. And I don't know, something clicked in me and thought, well, shit, I haven't come this far to now not win it. So apparently I ran the last two hours of that race quicker than I ran the first two hours. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what happened. It was just a desire to finish the race and do it well because I knew I'd never do it again. So I did win the race. I ran 95.4 kilometers. And when they gave me my trophy, <laughs> they handed it to me and they said, because you've run so well, you've won a place to represent Victoria in the 24-hour championships. So now everyone's clapping and cheering and they're saying, I'm in my head, all I can think of is now I've got to do that twice as long and it's in six months' time. Um, but this time I trained a bit more for it and I thought, why not? I've never, run, I've never been awake. Yeah. So I trained for it and... Six months later, I was in a 24-hour race, and that was another big story, which I ended up going on to win. And wow. I, set, I set a world record in that race. You say that so casually. 
Oh, you know, it's massive. <laughs> I know, I know. It was, it was huge. And again, it was that, this is where I really learned the power of the mind, you know, and I have learned since then, one of the greatest ways to test yourself is physically, because physically, when you get exhausted, when you, if you ever do personal growth workshops, it's all about pushing you to the brink of exhaustion because that's your true essence comes out. Or when you are in labor, you get so pushed in giving birth and then all of a sudden the opposing contrasting feeling of unbelievable love and joy when that baby is put on your breast or, um, you know, you can go through relationship heartaches and breakups. And then on the day of your wedding, you just realize that all of those people led you to this extraordinary human. And, you know, there's, there's always a beautiful way of looking at how we go through each of these moments in life. If you ever take the time to look at yourself and to be curious about your emotions and why you say the things you do and why you behave the way you do. And when you're in the middle of a 400 meter track by yourself with nothing else, but your own thoughts, you do think about that a lot. And all I kept thinking at one point was, I wonder how far I can push myself in one cycle of the sun. And I just kept pushing and pushing. And then again, in the morning, as the sun was coming up, there's a graveyard shift between midnight and 6am. And I really did struggle through that time, but I stayed out on the track. I just kept walking through that time. And I think that's what helped me win the race was that I didn't, everyone else was going into the pit stop tent. I just stayed on the track. All and, time. And yeah, most of the time, most of the time. Say, did you have a nap or anything? Or, or No naps, no naps. But certainly came in and got dressings changed on my blisters and changed shoes and clothes and things like that and ate a bit of something, but never slept in a 24 hour race. Um, and then, yeah, they announced that I'd won that and ran 168.5 kilometers, which is 102 miles. And all I could think of was I'd spent four hours off the track, complaining, whinging, eating, strapping, massaging. And then I thought, what could I have done if I hadn't been whinging? And then when they handed me my trophy, they said, you've not only set a world record, but you've won a place to represent Australia at the World Indoor 24 Hour Championships in London. And now my dream of being a netballer for New Zealand had become a runner for Australia. And my passion to travel meant that now I was about to go to London where I'd never been before. So it was interesting. My desire to get my log hours up turned me into an athlete. And um, I ended up running for Australia and set eight indoor records when I was in Mel uh, in London. And yeah, but I ran for two years. And then after that, it was like, mm, I think I've done enough. I think, yeah, it, it didn't drive me to want to go and do six day events or that 3,100. Although there's always a part of me that kind of would like to, but I haven't. <laughs> All right. That's incredible. How much do you think then putting yourself through that, those physical extremes? Because they are physical extremes. This, you know, that's that's. <laughs> I've not put myself through anything like that, really. Even though I, I do challenge myself, you know. But how much do you think that has set you up in, in other areas of your life by not resting on your laurels? Because it's human nature to avoid discomfort. I mean, we so easily do it. I think the reward means so much to me and it's not the reward of winning. It's the reward of completing something. It's the reward of seeing something through. It's the reward of knowing that I didn't give up on myself or the situation. Um, I probably am a very strongly driven person like that. And I believe we humans can get through anything. I truly believe that. I believe in everybody to do it. It's just whether or not you choose to do it. And some of us can choose to sit in the wallowing of the pity of the destruction of that. And some of us can choose to use it as a platform to become a bigger, better version of ourselves. And it was Cliffy and my coach saying that running and putting yourself through these extremes actually makes you a better human. <clears throat> and I think that's where I took that on. You know, there was a moment, there was one day I, um, I had arrived at university and I was late and I pulled up outside my, my classroom and my car, I went to park my V-dub, um, my Beetle, and I was in such a rush that the bumper hooked onto the tow bar of the car in front. I was trying to get into a tight car park and I freaked. And I got out of the car and was so panicked and full of adrenaline. I literally lifted the car up off the tow bar and then got in the car and pulled the handbrake on and went into class. Now, all my students were sitting in a classroom under the ground, but the window was at street level. So they actually all saw me do that. 
And I came into classroom, sat and hustled and bustled, didn't think anything of it and sat down and everyone clapped and someone did the bionic woman sound, the do, 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 you know, and I was like, what? And they all went, you just lifted a car. And I thought wasn't anything great until we went out in the break and I tried to lift the car again. I couldn't even budget. That's when I realized that it's at extreme. You've, you've heard of mothers or fathers lifting cars off kids or, you know, people climbing to the top of a mountain or doing something for their brother or sister who's ill or like you just, nobody knows their true potential until you are challenged. And that's why even as a personal trainer, I knew when I try, I know even to this day when I train myself and I think I'm pushing myself to a level 10 being my max, when I get a personal trainer or a coach in, oh, that's bullshit. My 10 is a six compared to having a personal trainer, which is why I believe in coaches, mentors. Um, there's always amazing personal growth workshops, spirituality, things that test us and push us beyond the realm of what we think. Because remembering back to what I said at the beginning, we all put meaning into our lives. And that meaning is based on our beliefs, perceptions, values, our parents, our experiences. But it's not true. Just as my mother taught me to grow up and believe that I was amazing because I helped her so much and I could do anything, um, other children have been told by their parents they're useless. Now, which one? Neither is right or wrong. But I just chose to believe that I was extraordinary. And yeah, maybe my mum's struggles of her life made me believe I was invincible on to a level. I don't say that with ego. I say that proudly, that I believe any human can do anything. Yeah, I hear you. You know, it reminds me, there's a line in a Jack Johnson song. Um, I think it was on the Curious George album. And it says, nobody ever told me not to try. And, and that, for whatever reason, that's just stuck in my head from, from the moment I heard it. And I often think about that. It's like, well, what happens if I didn't even think that I couldn't do it? So what would happen, you know, and, and just and just move forward like that? You know, Cliffy won the inaugural Sydney to Melbourne race at 68 years of age. I remember watching him cross the finish line and he was dazed. He looked terrible. I mean, you can imagine running for 10 or 12 days, whatever it was. And they said to him, Cliffy, how did you do it? You've beaten all the field that are half your age. Why didn't you stop and rest and stay in hotels like the others? Do you know what he said? I didn't realize I could. <laughs> so that's stuck in my mind. What if I didn't know I couldn't finish a 24 hour race? What if I didn't know I could climb Mount Everest? What if I didn't know I could give birth? What if I didn't know I could start a podcast? What if I didn't know I could start a business? If you, if you didn't know failure was an option, you'd never think about not giving it a go. So that line is so poignant. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Do you think, um, just before I switch topics, change gears here, do you think the universe presents challenges for us, for us to grow? Yes. I mean, or not. <laughs> I've done so much <laughs> mind stuff lately. I'm like, oh, it could be, it might not be. It, it is what it is. It's up to you whether you choose to put the meaning into that to do yeah. that. But I have chosen to look at it that way. I've chosen, look, in the throes of it, when I thought my marriage was over, we lost all our money um, in the 2008 you know, collapse. I thought my marriage was done. My other grandmother had just passed away and I was trying to launch a business. I honestly was lying on my bathroom floor going, you are freaking kidding me. This is, and my girlfriend turned around to me. She said, Kim, you've got to get up. You've got to get up. Your kids need you, you know, this. And I turned around and said, what if this is a sign from the universe to say, give up? And she looked me dead in the eye and said, or oh, what if this is the universe asking you, how bad do you want it? And so I could throw any reason or excuse at you. I can promise you there's an opposing inspirational thought to go with it. It's just whether or not you choose to see it. Okay. Let me stop you there for a second. You just said you lost all your money. You, your marriage broke down <laughs> and in the 2008 crash, like, like so flippantly, it's like, that's huge. <laughs> so what allowed you then to tap into the fact that you believe that this is an opportunity to grow in that challenge at that point how did you draw the I didn't in the that? moment I okay. didn't in the throes of it lying on my floor I didn't right um, you know my life was a mess at that point and I just didn't know who the hell I was or what it was about and that's probably the one time in my life where I could possibly have understood what depression looked like. I'm not a depressing type. I'm not someone who's ever suffered with depression. But in that moment, I, it, to me, it was like there was no hope. I did have two children, though, that did kind of 
keep me going and I did have a husband that still loved me and I did have a business I was about to launch um, and it was when my girlfriend said you know maybe it's the universe asking you how bad do you want it that I thought shit I'm just in the graveyard shift of another marathon that's all so to me my ultra marathons have become an extraordinary metaphor for life we all are in the ultra marathon of life and some of us right now are in the graveyard shift where it's tough it hurts we want to quit it's dark it's cold we feel alone we don't think we belong we don't think we're good enough that's what i call the graveyard shift and that can come in all forms it could be you know being attacked it could be losing money it could be not being able to buy a house a relationship breakdown the death of someone you love the you know there's a multitude of ways we can look at what those challenges are and it could be just a horrible comment on social media i'm not mm. suggesting any one of them is is better or worse than the other but they're they're all there right and that's a graveyard shift but like i said before this too shall pass the sun does come up you do get energy you can breathe and to me it's in those moments and i really heard this with you with the 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 the, the ice bath that we did and the three or two or three hours that we did in the breathing, you know, sometimes it's just a case of breath by breath, moment by moment. I've now just got through that. And there's another breath. And sometimes it's just a case of counting the breaths to know that you're still alive, that you're still here. And sometimes bringing it right back to the breath, which is why I was so challenged with the ice bath, but then hearing your voice and the power of what breath is, reminded me of all those other challenges I've had and to breathe through it and it actually makes me feel quite emotional thinking about it because you, you may not appreciate how much that 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 bath meant to me because I really didn't think I could do it and yet people would say but you've run for 24 hours but I was frightened of I, I don't know what it was I, I didn't know if I could do it and certainly being a presenter and a facilitator you feel like you can't fail even more mm. because people are looking at you. And yet when you came up beside me and your voice, and, and this is probably the power of having a mentor or a coach or someone who believes in you or knows that there's always another side, which is why I think it's so important we get therapy or help or people outside of our sphere because they know what we don't know sometimes when we're in the throes of that. And that belief, having someone believe in you when you've lost belief in yourself, is one of the greatest gifts and I know that that's now one of my greatest gifts is to help other people believe in themselves when they feel like the light's gone out yeah beautiful beautiful do you, do you think what was I going to say I've got your book here the art of self-love okay and one one thing um that's clear to me is your compassion and the your heart that you put into helping other people and with these experiences that you've had, are you able to look at them now with gratitude as a blessing that helps shape you, even though you've got the scars on your back, to go through those moments that have helped shape you to be the person you are today? I agree wholeheartedly. And I truly believe that I have been through those experiences those particular experiences um, so that when I stand on stage or when I speak in a podcast or when I write a book, I speak from a place of truly knowing that feeling um, and I don't put hearsay to it and mm -hmm. I don't minimize it and I don't minimize your pain. But I am also very strong in believing that you can live below the line on this and make excuses and blame and go into denial about what's happened in your life. Or you can draw a line in the sand, be accountable, responsible and take ownership for that and then decide who you're going to be in this moment. So I guess also, too, there's a part of me that's incredibly and I appreciate your words, compassionate and, and I do love all people, but I'm also not about resting on your laurels or totally. giving up or, <laughs> or, you know, giving in to something. I, I will take you on a ride. If you, if I've ever mean, I mentor people and I have a mentorship program and I will take you on that ride and I will listen to you, but I will not allow you to live in your story. I, I, it's not, no, that's not true. I will coach or support you to not live in your story. It's not up to me whether or not you do. Mm. Um, but I will show you a way if you're willing to listen to it. And if not, then I'm not your coach. That's all. I'm just not your person. And we're not all for all people. 
but all, tr all humans have all traits. So we know that all of us can be below the line. All of us can be amazing and above the line. So I think it's about having compassion for one another that sometimes we're in the graveyard shift of life and sometimes we're in the twilight and some of us are in the finish line of one event and we're about to start another one. You know, becoming a parent is a, is a great finish line for the pregnancy, but it's a great starting line for the next adventure, you know, so... I, I have found sport to be hugely satisfying for me. And I married, ended up marrying that guy, the cricketer. And we went our separate ways for three years, but I did marry him. And when he woke up to the fact that I was the right one, um, but he was a cricketer. So we've also, I've really appreciated being the partner of an elite athlete and supporting him through his life and be, getting to the top of his career and being a representative of New Zealand cricket for 10 years. And we've got two children that are highly aspiring athletes. I've got a daughter who's a dancer who is, you know, she's she's aspiring to be the top level dancer. And I've got a son who wants to play professional rugby. So oh, wow. yeah, it's it's kind of cool that they've got parents that have that don't. Tr I don't put pressure on them to be that, but I will always say to them, you don't want to leave the track not knowing that you haven't given it everything. Don't go to your grave not thinking you haven't given it all. Is that really everything you've got? Is that really who you truly are? Is that really all that you think's in the tank? Because I believe there's more. And yeah. yeah, and I also agree with what you were saying, where more is sometimes less. Those breaths, those moments, the solitude, the 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 quiet times are just as potent and powerful as the 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 big times too. Totally. Totally. Thank you for sharing. I am. Um, I want to touch on your book for a moment, The Art of Self-Love. And I often think about this topic as it coming from a male perspective, right? Because I'm sure as a male and a female, we, we when we hear the word self-love, we see it very differently. And for me, there was a lot of resistance around that. And for any men listening to this podcast right now, how would you describe this and why we should explore it? Well, I wrote this book because of my 16-year-old son huh. and my husband. So I'll tell you that this was written because of men in my life. So my 16-year-old son was going through a tough time. Um, and I'm sure anyone listening to this, when you love someone and you watch them go through self-loathing, not liking mm -hmm. themselves, um, hating on themselves, hating life, we also lost Danny's sister to suicide. So I'm very conscious of um, where our minds go and what, um, you know, that, that some people can get to such a dark place that that seems the only option. Or there's a psychotic episode that can take someone to a place that creates an outcome that obviously none of us want. So when my son was showing these signs, I was devastated. This is past the time where my husband had also gone through it because having, having lost his sister, he was also, for want of a better word, thrown onto the junk heap of life with sports. So here he was at 32, a top cricketer, and all of a sudden not wanted anymore. So I don't know if anyone can imagine hearing 110,000 people chanting your name at the MCG to then now, who are you without your sport? Who are you? when you have no other qualifications. So my husband then grappled for years as to who he was and who was he without being a cricketer. He dedicated his whole life to New Zealand cricket. So his um, slow spiral into his own self-loathing led us to our relationship breaking down and him going through a world of anguish at the same time we lost all our money in, a, in, in the financial crisis and that all hit at the same time and um, it was massive. And I can understand when I come up to, you know, for want of a better word, a 50,000 viewpoint looking down on my life, I could see why my husband broke and I could see why he went into a world of alcohol and drugs and self-loathing. And he was away from me seven, eight months of the year because he was now a cricket commentator. And he allows me to share this story, but he went into a major world of depression and all the psychologists had said to me is make sure your antenna is up because once there's suicide in the family, it can sometimes mean there's permission for others to do the same. And I never knew this stuff. I didn't understand it. None of us are psychologists. And I was so worried about my family and Danny's mom and children, the children of her. Like it was just, it was huge. So I went into protection mode and that's when we moved over here to Australia and 
I remember sitting there thinking, how do I help my son who's now, now in fast forwarding another couple of years where we did get through it with my husband and we did slowly crawl out of that with a lot of counseling and therapy and and there's other things I can share with that with you later. But now I'm looking at my 16 year old son and i had been trying for months to talk to him, but we all know that when someone's struggling, they're not going to hear it until they're ready to hear it. Mm -hmm. And my counselor had said to me about Danny, sometimes people have to hit rock bottom with both feet so that they can push themselves back up. So I had to watch and allow my son to hit rock bottom. And my desperation as a mum was to actually get in there and help him, but I couldn't. And there, nothing I said or did was helping that until this particular night he appeared on the end of my bed and just said, mum, and I, I don't know if I can swear, but I'll tell you exactly what he said. But, but my life's fucked. I hate myself and I don't want to be here. Now, Danny was home and lying in bed next to me. It was nine o'clock at night. Jacob was 16. His 17-year-old sister <clears throat> appeared on the end of the bed. All four of us were sitting on our bed. And I just looked at him and I said, I haven't got an answer for you. But for three years, I've been researching something and I want to share it with you. And he goes, yep. Yeah. So I pulled out my big A3 journal, A3, where I had transcribed all Anthony Robbins talks, Oprah, Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Joe Dispenza. I had spent so much time listening to all these gurus and transcribing their messages of hope and belief and self-worth and all of these things. And being an athlete, I tried to come up with a plan on how when you fall out of love with yourself or into a world of self-sabotage or self-loathing, what's the pathway back? Because as an athlete, if you can give me the steps, I'll do it. But to tell me to do it with my mind is kind of challenging. That, that was it for me. So I drew a big heart in the middle of the page and I wrote the word self-love. And I said to Jacob, sometimes the opposing thing to self-love is fear or, you know, how you're feeling right now, how is that? And he said, hate myself, life's fucked, um, hate the teachers, um, not good enough, self-worth, just 16-year-old boy language, he used it. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it all down under the word fear. And then I said, but the way back to yourself, the way back to self-love, the way to back to believing yourself is a process. And the first step, and I drew step one, was awareness, self-awareness. You have to be aware that you're in a bad place. Just being aware that life sucks right now means that you are loving yourself because you're aware that life's not great. You're actually taking ownership that life's not great right now. And he went, yeah. And I said, but the next step's really important. And that's self-care. You have to do something nice for yourself. When you're in the throes of despair, you've got to look after yourself. Most people turn to alcohol or drugs or eating terribly or, you know, one night stands or, you know, they sabotage themselves more because they're trying to avoid the pain. Whereas, in fact, the best thing you could do is make sure you have greens with every meal or um, go for a walk on the beach or say three things you're grateful for. Even in the moments of despair, you can be grateful the sun's shining. You can be grateful your cat's looking at you. You can be grateful your mum told you she loved you. There's, there's always something to be grateful for. And I said to Jacob, can you do that? And he said, yeah. And I said, and do you promise me with self-care and being an aromatherapist, I'm going to run you baths every night that I'm going to put oils in there to help with your muscles. I didn't say to help with your hormones and your brain and your mind, but, you know, to help with your muscles. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And I said, but Jacob, the third step is the biggest and the most important one of all, and that's self-discipline. Because you cannot have self-love without discipline. You cannot be a beautiful pregnant woman without discipline of looking after yourself. You can't be a before and after photo unless you look after yourself and show the discipline to do the skills. You can't get a degree unless you show discipline. You can't um, stick to a weight loss program without discipline. You can't um, get a, you know, you can't do anything without discipline. It takes, dis you can't love yourself without discipline, to be honest. It takes discipline. And I said, so Jacob, I'm going to ask you to not swear at a teacher for the next 28 days. You're going to have to go down to the beach twice a week. We're lucky we live by the beach. Twice a week, barefoot, and just run the beach. You're 16. You've got to train. Um, you also have to know with discipline that if you do make a mistake or swear at a teacher, then you just got to go back to self step one, which is awareness you've made a mistake and apologize for it, own it, and then step back into self-care. So to me, those first three steps are the doing. You have to do something. Yeah. You can't just sit back and hope life gets better. But with that, 
comes the next step, which is self-control. Now, some people might say self-control is to control the outcome. There's no such thing as controlling anything. The only thing I have control over is my behavior and my even that I don't even have control over sometimes. So what I mean by self-control is you have more awareness around how you control your behavior, your thoughts, your feelings. And with self-control, you it means if you're about to go and swear at somebody, you actually have better discipline around not needing to or wanting to bleat to someone that they shouldn't eat gluten-free, actually with discernment and more control, it's their journey, not yours. So I talked to him about the power I believe in self-control is magnificent because once you start feeling what it is to have control about the way you act and behave, that is real true love. And then the next step, when we have control, more self-control, we have more self-respect. And when we respect ourselves, there's no way you're going to put people down or there's no way you're going to be nasty to yourself or put crap into your body or not go for a walk on the beach or say nasty things. And I looked at my daughter and she said, actually, I said, what do you think is self-respect? And she said, self-respect, I think, is when you say nice things about people, when you don't get drawn into gossip, when you don't mm. put people down, when you don't judge. Self-respect to me, mum, is when you actually love who you are so much that you won't do anything to hurt it. And I thought, and I put that in the book because I thought she nailed it. And when we have self-respect, there's a word in New Zealand, a Maori word called mana. And that is a true, real power, self-power. Mana is to really own who you are. Mana is to trust in the God in you and to believe in the God in others. And it's just so powerful, that word. I, I can't even articulate it, um, but it's such a powerful word. And then when we have self-respect, the last step in my six-step process is self-acceptance. And that means we can accept ourselves, warts and all, the good and the not so good, the shadow and the light, the times when we know life sucks and the times when we know, I know there's times I've been an amazing mother. And I know there's times when I've been a dreadful mother. And to own both parts of me in that is to own myself wholeheartedly and to love myself. And I looked at Jacob and I said, I think that's the six steps to self-love. And he looked at me and he said, mum, I've never had anyone explain it to me like this before. You've got to write a book. And Danny had tears rolling down his face. And he said, that's what I needed four years ago. And I thought, you two are the reason I'm going to write this book. So that's how it's amazing. I had no idea. That's amazing. And it's so mm. amazing that from your own frustrations of pain with, with seeing your, your son go through where it is, that you're able to take something and turn it into that's just beautiful and golden. It's going to help so many other people from doing that, as opposed to it impacting you in a negative. Obviously, it's impacting you, but to, to take it on board in a different way, you're still able to see this challenge and grow from it and, and help others, which is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I just hope all the um, the females listening to this show will hopefully pass this podcast on to their, their partners to, to have a listen and hopefully that will land. Because for me personally, I've, I have needed a framework and structure and something to start to see the dots as opposed to just feel my way through in some respects, because otherwise it just doesn't land. It doesn't get through for especially us men. You know, well, Jacob confirmed it for me when he said that explanation just and it, and of course, you know, life can be ticking along and all of a sudden you get a phone call at four o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden you're back in out of the circle of self love. You think life sucks and everything's bad, but you've got this model to step back at first step is awareness. Awareness. I know it's not great. I've got to take care of myself. Oh, my gosh, it takes discipline to do that. And with that, I'm more controlled with the way I can't control what's happened, but I can control my reaction. I'm going to respect myself wholeheartedly and love the people I love even more and accept that there are some things I cannot change, but I can certainly become a better version of myself in spite of it. Yeah, beautiful, fantastic. I think I think about, because um, with frameworks, if you stick them on your fridge or you see them somewhere, you, you're, you're aware, the awareness, the first step that you speak about, there's a challenge happening, there's something going on, you can actually refer to a framework and work your way through it yourself. Yeah. And go, right, okay. Because we, we tend to know, once we become aware, we tend to know what's the right thing to do. 
<laughs> Whether we do it or not is another thing. Well, also, you know, when it comes down to the physiology, the brain itself has a whole lot of neuroplasty and, and these amazing neurochemical loops that for years you may have said, I'm a failure. People have told you you're a failure. You've failed mm -hmm. at things. So you've got this very strongly wired connection for failure. But if you take on those steps, it's never about eradicating that I'm a failure. It's just that you'll create stronger neurochemical connections that override them whenever they show up. So I'm never about hiding from yourself or losing who you are or pretending you were never that because that's what makes the tapestry of your life so beautiful is all the colors and the shades and the grays and the darks and then all the rainbows that come with it and I think you'd agree with me it wouldn't matter how old you are what shape you are what eye color you are, how little or how much hair you have when you meet someone that has a spark in their eye that's true beauty. That's true love. And it's never about aging, which is probably why I got so passionate about having a skincare company and aromatherapy company, because I'm not about, um, you know, aging with no wrinkles. I'm, I'm in my 50s now. There's, there's many more wrinkles coming. But I look at them and I think of them as stripes of honor and my, my stretch marks for, you know, I, I have two babies that there are women out there craving they're paying fortune to get those stretch marks. How dare I knock my stretch marks when there's women who would give anything for it? How dare I knock my breasts that are getting more and more saggy, you know, as I get older and <laughs> they fed two babies, you know, they, they have been an incredible part of me and there's women out there who've had to have theirs removed. How dare I knock my breasts when anyone would give anything for them, you know? I've just really learned the, the art of acknowledging what I've got, being respectful for what I have, because in a moment, it could be taken away. Uh, beautiful. I love it. I love it. I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask everyone on the show before we wrap it up. And one is, what does your morning routine look like? Oh, i very big on rituals. You know, with oils, okay. I love my rituals. I do love a morning coffee. I do love that. Um, so I will do that. I do my meditation. I Sometimes my meditation, by the way, when life's busy and especially when my children were young, it could be a 30 second meditation. The key is not to miss it. So it's just being mindful and sitting quietly for 10, 20, 30 seconds. I tick that off as a as a well done on the days that I'm challenged, or it can be up to 20 minutes. I've learned transcendental meditation. So I love doing 20 minutes twice a day. Um, I love my walk or gym or Pilates or a run. So I'll always do some form of movement. And sometimes on the days that I'm not feeling it and I just haven't got the energy, I'll do what I call my fab four and five, which is four exercises done in five minutes. So to me, <laughs> you're better off doing a little bit of something than nothing at all. So my fab four and five is just 10 sit-ups, 10 press-ups, 10 tricep dips and 10 squats. If I just, if that's all I get done for the day, I tick that off as well. And then I will have my aromatic shower. So I will take my loofah or my body brush with a couple of drops of my favorite oils into the bath, uh, into the shower. And I will body brush because I know that's great for my lymphatics and my skin. Then I hop out and there's a ritual I've never missed in 32 years ever. Um, it's, I call it my body boost ritual and it takes me 30 seconds. I put three drops of my favorite essential oil blend into my cream or oil, some magnesium. I pat it onto my body and then I rub my whole body from toes to head. And when I finish, I say one thing I'm grateful for. And on my website, there's a free manifesto you can download um, that's got four pages of positive things you can say. And I've got them up on my window, uh, up on my mirror, so that if I ever forget or if I'm in a bad place, there's always something nice to say. And I'll take a deep breath. And then I come out. I don't always feel like breakfast. I've realized as I get older, sometimes I like to intermittently fast all the way through to 11, 12 o'clock. I try to listen to my body the older I get. Mm. And sometimes that's why I'm really trusting now going for a five or 10K run isn't always the best thing for me. Sometimes being quiet and doing just gentle stretching is the best thing for me. So sometimes I'll have breakfast or I get straight into my work. But Lately, since I've graduated as a hypnotherapist and I've been doing my NLP, oh. I have really set a really strong, before I sit down, like even before we did this podcast, everything I do now has a strong intention. What's my intention? So my intention before this podcast was that 
I get interviewed by an amazing soul who brings out the best in me that allows me to be the conduit for messages for people that somehow, somewhere will hear something for them. So that was my intention before this podcast. And so everything I do now, I set an intention and my gosh, I've been achieving so much more with that simple intention. I'm going to be a great mum today when I drove down to Brisbane and take my son to the chiropractor the other day. He's 21 now, by the way, and he is phenomenal. And um, he's still a brat sometimes, but I still love him. And my daughter's <laughs> still cheeky and naughty, but they're just adorable. And, um, you know, I set the intention of being the best um, mama. And I say to them, you're going to have to get used to the fact that you don't live with me anymore. So be prepared to be lash, lav, you know, um, smothered in kisses and be told how much I adore you. And I will still tell you, I think you've taken too many cute pills and I will still tell you, you're the most amazing daughter and the most amazing son. So you have to, you know, so I do all these sorts of things, but intention to me has become a really powerful new ritual that I've brought into my day for the last probably six weeks. Amazing. How can you not have an amazing day after a morning like that? <laughs> <laughs> I see it. That's no joke. That is, yeah. And sometimes it's very quick. So don't get me wrong. It's not having hours because one of the biggest things I've learned through all the women that I've taught through my life is that it's always time and money. They're two best excuses why they can't do something. Mm. So I've taken all of that away and I'll always, it's never about time and money. It's whether or not you choose to make it a priority. That's all. Massive. And look, I'm, I'm, intention is huge for me it's massive it's something i've carried with me for a long time and uh, thought about on a daily weekly and a longer basis what's my intention of these moments and these days and it's like you like you say it's a game changer I, I really think we we have so much scattered awareness and scattered energy and we don't clarify what our, what it is our intent behind something and um, i think we can forget about how powerful that is i'm so glad you said that that's amazing and hypnotherapist, I had no idea. You've shocked me so many times today, or, or amazed me, I should say, not shocked, amazed. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know about? I've got a tattoo on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> I got it for my 40th birthday. There's two. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that that might have shocked you. <laughs> that's perfect. But may I ask what they are? Or is that going to One apply? is the Celtic symbol for mm. Anamkara, which means soul friend. And my girlfriend and I, um, when we, you know, moved countries, we both said what's something we could do that will always remind of each other. And we do believe we're each other's Anamkara, which means soul friend. And it's the most beautiful. And we are, I've got Celtic tradition, uh, you know, heritage. And I put that beautiful emblem on my butt. And then I also, because I ran for Australia, I couldn't quite put a kangaroo or koala, but have it, but because I'm a Kiwi, I put the silver fern on there as well. Amazing. That was not what I was expecting. But that's, <laughs> that's probably the best answer I've had on the podcast, for sure. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with someone from any time frame anywhere in the world that's inspired you or made an impact in your life, who do you think it would be and why? Do you know, I've, I've often thought about it, you know, there's so many celebrities. I always thought someone like Madonna when I was young would be someone I'd love to, to sit and have a chat with. But the older I get, the more I realise seeing my children get older and listening to their view on the world and having opinions now at 22 and 21, I am fascinated by them. And also, you know, people that maybe aren't celebrities, people that have gone through challenges, people, the everyday person who listens to our podcasts, the who aren't just everyday people, they're extraordinary mm. everyday people. But to sit there and listen to people's stories has been one of the most um, inspirational thing I've ever been a part of. So to be, I can't say a name, but if one of your listeners turned around and said to me, you know, that they had a story, I would give anything to have dinner with that person to hear their story. I, I honestly do. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, last question. With everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on? There's, there's a quote that I say a lot, and I think it's quite poignant to share it here. Um, you know, when I've talked a lot about the, the light and the dark and that, it's the, the contrast of life. But if you can understand that the best way you can, the best gift you can give this planet is your love and your happiness and your extraordinariness, which is a new word. Um, but this quote is perfect for that. If there is light in the soul, there is beauty in the person. If there is beauty in the person, there is harmony in the home. If there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. 
if there is order in the nation, there is peace in this world. How awesome is that? Isn't it? That's what, that's, you know, I just want to say something about to that, I think for everyone, and I'm sure you'll add to it before we wrap it up, but with everything that's going on in the world right now, and we can get so overwhelmed and caught up and, and like, what do we do? You know, for me, it's always come back to the self. How can I improve? What can I do to myself today to be just a little bit better than I was yesterday? And that ripple effect moves on. And I've never heard that quote before. That's incredible. That's beautiful. That's a lovely quote, lovely proverb, Chinese proverb. It's just, yeah, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? Which comes back to, it comes back to us, shine our light and that ripples out into our beautiful community mm. and our family. Amazing, Kim. What a way to end it. Where, where can we send everyone? Are you, where's the best place to follow you? We'll have links in the show notes anyway, but um, yeah, if they want to um, learn more about you. My and Facebook, you, yes. I was going to say, I don't want to forget your podcast. You, you started a podcast <laughs> recently as well. I'll make sure that's linked in as well. I feel very so. privileged. I, I was on a podcast show for seven years with Cindy O'Meara and Karen Smith on Up For A Chat. Um, and then we've decided that came to a close at the end of last year. And this year I started up the self-love podcast, which you can find on the wellnesscouch.com um, or any of the, the, the beautiful platforms. Um, but my Facebook page is Kim Morrison Training, where you'll find that's my business page, my my. my my face page. Um, and then I love Instagram, which is Kim Morrison. And then the number 28, my business is 28.com, the word 20 and the number eight.com. And the thing that I launched just before COVID hit was my self-love and wellness mentorship program, which is an evergreen program. You can come in at monthly or annual. And we just do weekly. I coach every week, every Tuesday night, uh, all pre-recorded. And we have beautiful guests and masterclasses and really do learn the art of self-love. And that's at KimMorrisonTraining.com. Kim, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing everything on your show today. You speak so openly and from the heart and uh, i have no doubt you'll inspire many uh including myself as well so thanks for all that you do and for being a guest today i really appreciate it thank you and i just want to say thank you for being a guest on my podcast it's been one of the biggest hits of my show it was privileged to interview and here we are cannot say thanks enough amazing thank you kim thank you